Well, hey, good morning. Jesse already stowed the bad joke. I was going to say that one this morning. I haven't seen you since last year. I've been trying to use that as much as I can to see how many people give me a face. Like, you know, how your teenagers give you that face when you say something over and over again. They're like, that's just so stupid. I can't believe they said that. Well, I'm glad you're at church this morning. You guys ready to hear some good stuff? So, um, I got a lot more things on my heart that I'd like to just throw out there at you, but I don't, I don't, uh, when I was back here just listening to Jesse, which was amazing, by the way, what he just shared with you this morning. I don't know if you know that. That was very prophetic, um, which means that, it, not that whatever he doesn't say is not prophetic, but that was very specific for, uh, for what's going on in some people's lives. Um, and you may not, uh, some of you will be like, that's not for mine, but they're telling you, there are people that are walking through some things right now. That was perfect. And he does not know what they are walking through. So it's God that's so cool. Remember we talked about gifts a few weeks ago? It's a gift of the Holy Spirit right there. Sharing words of, of wisdom or words of knowledge about how to move and what to do or to confirm something that you feel in your heart. See, God is so good at what he does, I'm telling you. Amazing gift. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Jesse. Well, are you guys happy in this new year? Yeah. Right? Because you've been confessing Happy New Year, right, for so long, telling everybody Happy New Year. Did you guys come in with a great smile? Look at your neighbor and smile at him. Yeah, oh, so... <laughs> Some of you, that's like extremely painful. My gosh. I don't know about you, but I can, I over smile a lot. You guys over, over smile. Like, you know, just smile. But I'm like, yeah, you know, just, yeah. So I try to keep it calm. Keep it cool, you know what I mean? Ephesians chapter three, if you got your Bibles. Um, let me pray real quick. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity in this new year to launch into uh, something new something new and fresh for what it is that you're saying for us in this season of our lives. And we honor it and we open up our heart to receive it. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's new. It's, it's kind of hard to grasp and swallow some things for new, that are new. So I pray that we will have the grace uh, to just be uh, open and, and ready for what it is that you're going to do in this new year of our life. And so um, big things, unexpected things, uh, so we just thank you once again for your goodness, that it is overflowing, and it's more than we can even dare ask or think. So we thank you once again for this family. We are so blessed to have an amazing church family. And so I ask for uh, your continued uh, hand upon them. Holy Spirit, guide us and lead us as we walk through, not only today, but as we walk through this next week. Uh, teach us what it is that we need to know uh, to set us on the course that you've designed for us. So we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, say Amen. All right, so this year, we, have, we just finished a series of, I think we were in it for almost the whole year, called the reprogram. We were talking about reprogramming, and then we're talking about changing the way we think about the gospel. And then we went into a sub-series kind of like talking about how that works, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is vital. He is God in this earth and in our hearts. Uh, he left us his spirit, and that's how he moves and navigates is through that. So the, whole, the reprogrammer or the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches us, guides us, does all of these things within us, and he's with us every day. So now we're going to, uh, um, I'll tell you kind of how this started. So I was in a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and, and they were going through this difficult situation, and we were, I was listening to them talk about their situation and it popped in my heart. I mean, just really quick, and I just kind of said it. You know, sometimes you just say things that come in your mind because you're trying to kind of figure out how to help them. So I was talking, and then all of a sudden, uh, this came out of my mouth. Hey, just change the subject. And I thought, and, and then after I said it, we kind of kept talking, and I was like, hey, 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 hang on. I think that may have been from the Lord right there. Just change the subject. And uh, how many knows that many times in life, whenever you're going through something hard, if you can change the subject, uh, it, it, transforms the situation. But we're not going to change the subject by like trying to divert, and, hey, look over here, whenever we're trying to distract. We're actually going to change the subject in a, in a way that begins to take us on the right course versus on um, how we may feel or what we may be seeing with our eyes, okay? So we're going to kind of adjust some things. So I want to really specifically talk about some things here in the first part of this year that I think is um, important, like vitally important of why people may not see results in their life so much. And and I'm going to kind of throw some things out there. So just have your big net up this morning because I don't know what's going to come flying out of here, okay? So just have the big net up just so you can catch it. Ephesians chapter 3, if you got your Bibles. So I've asked this a few months ago, but I'm going to ask again because i got a little bit different specific uh, direction with it. How many of you like to ride rides? Yes. Just like a few of you. Okay. So um, I'm not a big rides person. Now, let me get more specific. How many like to ride spinning rides that are really scary? Yeah. Okay, so that's the thing really where... Uh, it kind of, you know, takes a wrong turn. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, 
do you mind if I do a little psychology out here? And, and I'm going to use my general psychology degree that I have, and I'm going to diagnose you. Is that okay? So I'm going to diagnose you with this degree that I got, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to say that you probably have that experience or feel the way you feel about it, because I hate scary, I hate rides. Well, I hate certain rides. Spinning rides that are scary, I don't like those. I don't understand the point of those. They will not be in heaven because they don't, we don't, God doesn't like dizziness and spinning or something. I don't know. That's the devil. So anyway, so, um, so my, my diagnosis is probably because you experienced something. Look at your neighbor and say outstanding diagnosis. So the reason you have that is because you experienced something that actually made you say, I hate this, right? So uh, I paid a lot of money to get that degree, by the way. So just, just go ahead and receive that change your life. Um, so anyway, I was thinking about for my life. So I remember the reason why I hate spinning scary rides is because uh, we had a little local fair come to Locust Grove and my parents owned this little store called Dave Co. How many remember Dave Co. back in the day? Just my aunts. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so we had this little store and it had the first video rental. You guys don't even, how many remember video rentals when they were big discs? You had to put it in there, remember? And it came out and it was like a record and it played, but you got to watch it. Then halfway through the movie, you had to take it out and turn it over. Some of you are like, where are you from? The moon? Yeah, that's what, that's what it was like. So my parents had the first one like in this area. So they like, people come in and rent these videos. Well, they, uh, uh, they would bring a little local little fair rides amusement deal into the, into the parking lot. And so, uh, so I was a kid growing up there. So I spent a lot of time there. And so we would go out there to that little fair. Well, they had like the teacup ride. I call it teacup because I don't know what else it's called. Should be called the vomit ride because that's what it's all about. So you sit in it you with buddies and then they turn that center wheel. And if you don't turn the center wheel, it's cool because you just kind of rotate. But you get ignorant friends that, that, that don't care about anybody else. And they just, so I got in with my two buddies and we got in this thing because I never rode this before. We get in there and they make this thing. I feel like we're in a tornado. It is going so fast. I can't see anything. I am just like, I'm sick. I'm yelling. They're laughing, you know, because yeah, that's how friends are. They don't, they don't care. They think it's funny that you're sick and you're going to throw up. And I'm yelling. So finally the guy stops the ride. I get off the ride. I am mad. I'm probably like nine. I am mad. I don't like my friends anymore because they wouldn't stop. And I determined that day, and watch this, that day at nine years old, I will never ride another one of spinning rides like that again. I want you to watch this. At nine years old, I made a decision to never do something and I didn't do it again. So think about the power of a nine-year-old's decision. I made that at nine years. I just now was thinking about that. I made that at nine years old, never did it again. So how many knows that, that, well, and because of that, because of that decision about scary spinny rides, I decided that I don't want to ride any rides because, right, that's how we do. We have one experience that's off and we're like, I don't want to do anything ever again. You have a bad date. It's like, I'm never dating again, right? It's never like, well, okay, that's just a bad choice. I'm never doing this again. So I, I, I swore. So I grow up into the eighth grade. Well, if you go from Locust Grove, you had, you had eighth grade graduation trip, which, you know, you went to Bell's Amusement Park. How many remember Bell's Amusement Park in Tulsa? They had a roller coaster called the what? Cinco. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you got so I'm going, I'm in eighth grade, you know, I'm super cool at that age. So I'm going to, eight, hey, Matt, were you at Locust then? Yeah. yeah. Matt was, oh, you wasn't? Yeah. Matt was in my grade. So anyway, so we go on this field trip, you know, and there's going to be ladies there. So how many knows you can't not ride rides and play it super cool at Bell's if you're not riding? You can't ride the like, the canoe ride where you're floating in water and just float. That's not going to cut it anymore. You can't have your dad riding with you, you know, in the cars that just go... So I'm like, I got to figure this out because, but I found somebody at the school who was terrified as I was. His name was Jeremy Brown. Still lives in Locust. And I was like, Jeremy, we're going we're gonna to ride this ride. We're going to do something. We cannot be the girl guys on this trip and not, because even the girls were riding. I thought we got to do something. So we decided, hey, let's, let's ride this thing together. So we made a decision to get on the Zingo. And all I could think of was I'm going to throw up. I'm going to throw up. This thing's going to go. I'm going to get sick. I got on that ride and I screamed the entire ride. You know what? Nobody could tell who it is because the girls are screaming. So I just got, I just matched their pitch, you know, and just stayed right with them. So we rode this ride. I got off. And you know what? When I got off, I thought, hey, that was kind of fun, actually. Because it wasn't scary spinny ride. It was kind of just going fast and up and down mountains and hills. I thought, hey, I kind of like that. So what's interesting, what I say all that to say this. When we experience something, we attach, we attach a, 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 
like a little tag to it that says, okay, this is a bad experience, so I'll never want to do that again. So I'm going to just throw this out there and just kind of lead into this. So you may have gone to church many times in your life. Most people have gone to church in their life, more than once, maybe multiple times. And they've gone to church and they've experienced church in a way that has caused them to kind of feel like a scary spinny ride. They don't like it. This is like, this is weird. The people are weird. They act weird. They don't, they're not nice. All this kind of, there's, there's so many things that you could, that you have experienced that would be this. But I just want to kind of say this before you get too deep. Um, and so when you have a bad experience, especially with church, then it becomes something like, you know that we're supposed to go to church because God loves us, right? And all that stuff. So we go out of obligation or we go just to, just because you're supposed to. Go because you're not obligated to as far as like, I don't know if I'm gonna go to heaven. If not, I just go because it's what you do on Sundays because there's nothing else until football comes on at like noon. So you got all these ideas and thoughts that come in your mind because of this. Now, what's interesting about this is I wanna say this about your experience. Your experience with church uh, had nothing to do with God. It had to do with either religion or it had to do with people that misrepresented who he is. And so it's important to to, to to differentiate that. Because remember, whenever I said rides, I just gave it all rides. Anything that had to do with you having fun was out. Why? Because you may get sick. You may get sick. I don't want to go to church because someone may hurt my feelings. Okay, now I want you to watch this. And so what happens, we equate God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to church experience or religion. Or we relate that to somebody who was going through something at that moment and acted out and misrepresented him in a way that caused us to feel unaccepted. Does that make sense? You guys got really quiet and really unsmiley. You're like, I've been hurt in church. If you've been in church very long, your feelings have been hurt. It's just a fact. Why? Because you're around people. I go to basketball games and I get mad every time I go. Why? Because people are crazy. I'm the only normal person in the gym and, and everybody else's gets nuts. And so it's just like, oh my God. And you know what it makes me want to do? Not go. It makes me run around and sit. It makes me want to be the basketball police. That I can walk in there and I make everybody calm down and act right. And then if they don't, I get to kick them out of the game. Take them to the back and we have a class on how to behave at sports, right? Wouldn't it be great if that's how it worked? But it doesn't work that I think it's a great idea. I just come up with that. I think that's really good. Ephesians chapter three. I want to show you. I'm going somewhere. Now, I want you to do something for me. I want you to remember not your church experience when you got hurt because that's what I do. I, I think about the scary spinny ride anytime I get ready to get on rides. I think about that day when I was nine. And it, and it starts to cause me anxiety or a little bit like, oh, I don't want to do this. I just don't want to experience this. And so what I want you to do, and so in your life, if you've experienced God or around God or anything like that, and it has been negative, anytime you get close to that idea or close to him, what will end up happening is you'll start to relive that experience. That experience or that feeling of that experience will cause you to back away from it. Uneven, unknowingly, unintentionally, you're, you're not like, I am not doing, you'll just slowly back away, find something else. Why? Because that's, that is your experience. That is what is, is written now on your heart as a core belief, meaning this, it will guide you no matter if you have to consciously think about it or not. When someone says, you want to go to amusement park Six Flags? I'm like, nope. It's not like, hey, that would be kind of maybe fun. No, I'm not going with you. Why? Because it's in my core belief. I don't want to do it. I still not got that worked out yet. Now, how do we get there? Go to Ephesians chapter three. Now, I want you to think about when you experienced maybe the day you were born again or maybe a time when God answered a prayer and you knew it was him and you knew it was him and it transformed your life. Can I give you one of my experiences? I remember going to a pastor's. I didn't, I just, that's rhetorical. I was just gonna do it anyway. So uh, I remember going to a pastor's uh, little I, they call them, a I guess it's a retreat where it's, it's like about 40 pastors went to this church. So amazing. They just brought us in, just took care of us for, for like three days. And I remember that, that I went to this deal and they were teaching and then they were going to pray for pastor, all of us in that room afterwards. And so how many knows that when you go to like an event, you want like the main guy to pray for you? Anybody know? Right. Cause he's got, he's got all the goods, right? He's the main guy. It's not true by the way. So I went to this conference and I'm thinking, you know, we're lining up to get prayed for. And I'm like, I'm going to go over here and get in his line. 
But it was like everybody was lined up in his line. So I was like, well, I don't want to wait. This looks kind of dumb. So this one guy standing over here by himself. So I'm like, I'll just slide over in his line. I walk over to him. And man, he just, he just grabs my hands. Big guy, like a big kind of teddy bear guy. And he just grabs my hands. He starts praying. Oh my gosh, the moment he started praying, man, I just start boohooing. The reason why I started boohooing because everything that was coming out of his mouth were things in my life that I were currently struggling with or dealing with that was hard or that I'd never talked about or that I didn't share with anybody. I was just kind of walking through it on my own very unsuccessfully. And he began to pray for me. And man, I began to boohoo. And I was like, what in the world? And that day I realized something very much. It has nothing to do with anybody. It has to do with what he knows. And someone that's willing to just be open before him, he will flow through them in ways that will blow your mind. He will flow through you in ways that will blow your mind. Now, I'm saying this to say this this morning, is that whenever he prayed for me, I remember that prayer vividly. I remember getting finished with that and being speechless to say to him, he's probably like, oh my God, I don't even know if I'm praying correctly, but I'm praying over this guy. His mind was probably so where, somewhere different. He probably just praying what was coming to his mind. He had no realization until after the prayer, I'm like, holy moly, everything you prayed. And I couldn't hardly get the words out because it was so, it was such an experience for me that it changed my perspective about prayer and people praying for me. Now, now why is that important? Because we have prayer over here every week. We have prayer teams. You may not even know who they are. So people will be like, well, how come the pastor didn't pray for us? Because I don't have anything to offer as much as they do. Because it's not me that needs to pray for you. It's what he has to say. Let that sink in. Come on, just let the dig into it. It has nothing to do with what I say. I'm just a person just like you. I have a lot of flaws just like everybody in this room. But God can use any situation to transform your situation currently. Change your mind, transform. It impacted me. That experience I think about a lot when, I, when, I, when I'm prayed for. If I'm going through something hard, I, I think about that a lot. Why? Because it puts me in a perspective of connecting with God. Now, I need you to see that. I connect with him. Uh, can I tell you why it's difficult? Let me read Ephesians 3 because I've told you that like eight times and then I haven't read it yet. Ephesians 3, this is what we would call Paul praying for the church in Ephesus. And this is a, a prayer. And I want you to see what he's saying because it gets a little wordy. And sometimes we don't, we don't kind of really pay attention to what he's actually saying. We just kind of read through it and say what he's saying. Okay, this is what he says in verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit, in the inner man. So to me, I'm, I read that and I'm like, I don't even understand what that means. So I want you to think about it. He said, I'm praying so that you'll be strengthened on your inside in the inner man. So uh, have you guys ever been in, a, in a, like a pre-game something and then you're like listening to music and then you get all fired up? So what is happening in that moment that you're getting fired up is you are experiencing something within your mind and your heart that is causing you to start to get into what you're about to do, okay? So that when you get into the actual moment, you're, you're ready to go, you're fired up, right? Your coach is like, let's go, let's kill them. And you're like, yeah, let's kill them. And what's funny is we say we're gonna kill them, but we're just tackling them, you know what I mean? But we're gonna kill them. And so, but we get fired up, why? Because we're experiencing something. So he's telling here, I want you to be strengthened on the inside. I want you to experience God in such a way where it begins to affect you and cause you to have a momentum shift within yourself. Does that make sense? Okay, let's read on. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that this strengthening on the inside, this momentum shifting is because you are so rooted and experiencing the love of God in a way that causes you to be so full of faith. Does that make sense? Verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height. So he said to the point that you're experiencing this, so that you're experiencing this vastness of how amazing and how great that your God is. That's, how, that's what he's trying to get the point across. He's praying this over the church of Ephesus. Now, this is important, right? So it's really focusing or leaning into an intimacy with God. This, this relationship that is intimate but how many knows and if, it's, if it's intimate, it's got to be personal. It can't just be conversational. It's got to be personal. Like it's got to have an, 
an effect on you. I'll get there in just a minute, okay? Now, he culminates this prayer in verse 19, but I'm gonna read it out of the Amplified because it reads differently. Watch this in verse 19. This is, this is I, I love this part of this verse. Let's go to verse 19, guys, real quick. That you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. That you may that you may be filled up throughout your being to the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives completely filled and flooded with him, I think. I can't remember the last part because I left it off. Think about that. So look at the wording. His wording is talking about so that you will have an experience with him that is beyond mere knowledge or information. So think about this. You guys remember when you met your spouse or your significant other or your girl? Maybe you're just dating your girlfriend or boyfriend. You guys remember that when you met them? You're like, whoa, you know? You may have to think back a few years. Okay, I get that. So just kind of pull that file up and think about that. Or maybe when you get home, think about it. It's interesting because if you think about it, man, that's just like, wow, I'm, I am excited about this person. You know, I, oh, wow. And you just can't stop thinking about them. But what if when you met them and you were like, whoa, what if from that moment forward, you just got together with your buddies and was like, man, she is so good looking here and you don't even understand. And that's all you did was just talk about them. You never went and spent time with them. You just talked about them. When you passed them, you were like, hey, you know, just kept on walking. But you never, ever did anything. You just got together and had conversations. Are you getting the point yet? That's what we do at church. We get together and we just talk about how awesome God is, how much he loves us. We don't really know him that well. Why? Because it's an experience. If it's not an experience, how many knows that relationship's not gonna last long? If you're not face-to-face and you're not having conversations, that interest level is going to go down. Why? Because love cannot grow. Love will not grow when there's no experience. So why is church so hard? because I'm not experiencing anything. I come to church, some guy rattles off information. I'm like, that's pretty interesting. I'll believe I never experience him. And because I don't experience him, church feels boring. Church feels disinteresting. Why? Because if I don't know you, if I'm not spending time with you, I won't be interested in it. But if I'm experiencing him, it is completely interesting. I can tell you when that guy prayed for me, and those words come out of his mouth, I was really interested in it because it, what it showed me was God loves me more than I even understand. I'm acting like a bonehead, doing dumb things, thinking stupid, thinking terrible about myself. And here is God up there just like, how about this? That's how much I love you. And how much it just influenced my life. Why do I struggle so much weekly with because I don't experience in him. Now, if you're coming from a charismatic circle, that means we got to get the Holy Ghost rolling. That's not anywhere what I'm talking about. Because that's just most emotionalism. I'm talking about experiencing him where what you're experiencing is something true and real, like the fact that you prayed and God answered your prayer. Here's an interesting thing about praying and God answering our prayers. Many times God is answering and already answered your prayer, but we don't recognize him as answering it. We just kind of chalk it up to, well, it just kind of happened. Remember the story I gave you about the cups and the, or the big order and all that last week? We would just chalk that up to, well, thank you, that didn't stress us out. Not realizing that God orchestrated it so perfectly where there was no stress on it at all. That's an experience. You know why, you know why I, I started to see that over the last few weeks? Because I had determined that I want to, I read this verse because this month, I, I prepared this like four months ago, by the way, just letting you know. It's because of experience. And I, so I've been really trying to notice an experience, meaning this, that when something happens, I know it's him, okay? I know that it's God doing something because it's so important because if I don't know that experience, if I don't have that experience, eventually God becomes disinteresting to me. Why? Because when religion takes part, it becomes disinteresting. When there's no relationship, he becomes very disinterested. It means this, he's just an idea, right? We talk about God like, oh man, freedom, all this thing. But that's just an idea we talk about all the time, right? One day, one of these days, it's gonna happen for us. There we go. When's the last time that you experienced God? Think about that. Just, just kind of open your mind and your heart and ask yourself the questions. When's the last time that you truly experienced him? 
And, and just kind of think, oh my God. When I was thinking about that, I was like, oh my gosh. I'll go through times when I'm just doing this. So I told you a few months ago that I'm a movie. I love movies, but I am really into them. Like I am emotionally connected to the movie. I cry at them all the time. And you're like, what a baby. Uh, hang on. Before you start judging me really quick. Just, so I'm, I'm super invested. In it. And, and so I was like, what's wrong with me? Why do I do this? Well, I've, I've discovered something over this deal. The reason is, is because I am experiencing this movie. Meaning this, that when I'm watching that, it's like when these two people are talking, they're about to kiss and it's about to, I am thinking that's my best friend up there and I am so happy for, for some reason, my mind is thinking in that kind of way so that when they're having this wonderful moment, I'm just starting to cry. I'm like, wow, that's such a great deal. And people are like, wow, that's weird. Why are you so weird about that? It's because I'm experiencing the movie. See, what happens is some of us say this, watch this, this is, I'm just gonna nail you, so just get ready. Have your armor on, okay? Is this, that's not real. Some of you just, come on, just wear it. <laughs> that's not real. Meaning this, what I'm watching on there is not real. Some of you like to watch scary movies. The reason why you don't get scared is because you've determined in your mind it's not real. I, on the other hand, think it's all real. <laughs> so that's why I don't watch them. Because I'll be fighting devils all night. <laughs> Noises, all that. And so, but notice, it's about experience. So the reason, you want to know how this revelation came to me? I was watching a Christmas movie over this holiday. It's called The Christmas Wish. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It's about this mom. She's got these kids and, and the oldest boy, uh, the dad just kind of left them. And it's his son. And then, and then she has a daughter with this guy. And they just kind of, he just kind of ups and leaves. Well, they don't have any money. So they go off and try to figure out how to start over. She's got a baby, a medium daughter. And then this boy that's like 11. He's the oldest. They go on this journey and, and it's lifetime or something. So they get a little bit risque, you know, in there. Um, meaning that someone, they may, they may kiss and that kind of stuff. It's, you know, Hallmark's not risque like that. Lifetime gets a little bit out there, you know. You guys would know about that. You're not those kind of watchers. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, in this storyline, there's a part in this movie where they don't have any money, so they stay in this little hotel, and this girl draws a Christmas tree on the wall with markers, you know, and they're like, oh, my God. So she draws a Christmas tree, and they're stressed now because she has no money. Her car's broke down. You know, just think of every worst thing that could happen on a movie, and that's what's going on in this lady's life. And they're going to kick her out of her room, all this stuff. And the little girl turns to the mom and says, hey, mom, don't worry about that. Jesus will fix it. I just start boo-hooing. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I actually caught myself and thought, what is wrong with me? And this is what come into my heart. Was I just connected to the fact that Jesus loves us and he will fix what it is that you're walking through. And guess what? He fixed it in the movie. You're like, well, they wrote that in the script. Can I tell you this? He already wrote your script too. And he fixed your story. Right that? Remember, the story isn't over. The story isn't good. Your ending is not going to end bad with him. Why? Because he wrote the story. I'm just knocking it out right now. <laughs> Psalm 27. Come on. Psalm 27. This microphone's giving me fits. Ears are too big. Got a haircut this week. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. I want to show you some things here. You guys with me so far on what we're talking about? I'm not talking about some spooky, weird experience of God. I'm talking about that you experience him in their everyday life. An awareness of him that he is doing stuff all the time in our world. 27, look at verse 13. This is David. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of God or the Lord in the land of the living. Now, if you'll go to the context before, he's talking about that, that the enemies, there was false witnesses rising against him. Uh, you ever had just things going opposite? They're not going your way. Everything seems to be going opposite of the way. And it's just like, ah. Uh, and, and David's writing about this saying there's, there's so much false witness rise against him to accuse him or to say that, that he is not a good leader for them. All this stuff rising up. And he says to them, he says in this, in, this, in, this, in this psalm that I would have lost heart, I would have given up had I not believed that I would see. Believe that I would see it, not just, hey, I heard in the Bible that it'll happen one day. I believe that I would experience this while I was living, while I was alive. Why would he believe that? Can I tell you why? 
because he watched God deliver him with a lion and a bear and Goliath. I have no doubt that David was sitting there thinking, this is hard, but he would think back to, remember that day when I fought a guy that was not should be fought? I wasn't even going to fight. I was delivering groceries. Next thing you know, I'm in a fight and I win this fight. Now I'm like a warrior guy and I'm 13. Think about this. I don't have any doubt that he was older at this time and he's thinking back and thinking, God delivered me from all those things. He even said when he fought Goliath, God delivered me from the hand of a lion, mouth of a bear, or mouth of a lion, mouth of a bear, whatever he said. And he'll do no different today to this. He was experiencing, thinking about the experience that he had with God, thinking, this is not a problem. Why? Because he's already done it. Are you, follow, are you following the story right now? And he says this, if I, no, I, would not, I would have given up if I hadn't believed that I would see it while I was alive. Church has decided that the goodness of God, I don't mean like, I mean the general church has decided that the goodness of God for us is going to be in heaven. That's where the goodness, it's gonna stink down here, but it's gonna be good up there. And that's not the story that he wrote. That's not what he designed this for. Jesus did not come to this earth, live and die, buried and raised so that we could say, hey, when we get to heaven, it's going to be awesome. Right? How many of you are like that where you're like, yeah, 25 years, I'm retiring, man. I'm going to do some stuff 25 years from now. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to have fun. Why don't we have fun right now? Well, because it's not fun. Got to go to work. So what it is, is we have determined that our experience for goodness happens when you're off of this planet. Whenever he said, I want to see it in the land of the living. I believe that I'll see it. Not then, but in the land of the living. What if I could enjoy everyday life? What if I could enjoy the process that I'm in now because of how good God is every day? Jesse was just all over the goodness of God this morning. He said it's a gift from God. Let me just throw this out there. That means that anything good in your life that has ever happened came from him. A person sitting next to you, that's a gift. Come on, just go ahead and pat that spouse on the back. So thankful for that gift, right? Because watch, I don't know if that's a gift from God. I'm telling you, that's, that's a gift from God. And if we saw it as a gift, think how it would change our perspective. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, okay? Last person to be talking about that, but listen, it would be changing, it would change our experience. It would change what we saw, it would change how we approached other people. Okay, so let's dig in a little further. Ephesians chapter three, we're gonna go to the amplified version one more time, okay? Ephesians three, verse 20, here's continuation of the, talking about personally experiencing God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we could dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. And to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So he precedes that verse by saying this, I want you to experience him personally, on a personal level, not a mere knowledge. Most of the time in church, we just experience the knowledge of God. We get a lot of information about him, but it's not experiential. It's not intimate knowledge. It's just information knowledge. Meaning this, I know the what it takes to fly a plane. I know you gotta have lift, drag, all that other stuff. But if you put me in a plane, we're crashing. Why? Because I don't know how it works. I know about it, but I don't know it. And what he's saying about this is I don't want you to know about him. I want you to know him. And let me just tell you, that's not just him saying, that's God actually saying, Paul, I need you to tell him, listen, I don't want them to know about me. I want them to know me. That's a crazy conversation. This is the creator of the universe sounding like he is just wanting you to talk to him. Isn't that crazy? I'm like, I would be like, I don't want, I'm deleting him. I'm deleting Josh. He acts up. He stresses me out. But he's like, no, I want you to, I, I, because I know, this is what God said. I know if you experience me, it'll change your life. I know if I can get a hold and let the love of God pour out in you and open up on the inside of you, it'll change who you are. It's awesome, isn't it? God's so good. So we can, he said, and what you experience is beyond what you could even dare hope or dream or even ask. I can ask for some crazy things, 
But he said, you can't even come close to his imagination of how he feels and what goodness looks like to him. When God creates the universe, he's just like, oh, that's pretty good. When he creates a man out of the mud, he's like, that's pretty good. So when he says good, it's like far beyond I can even describe. So can you imagine if he said something's awesome? Our head would just go and pop because it would be so vast beyond our comprehension of how he thinks and feels. Okay, let's dig in. We're not there yet. We're almost, we're shutting down. Psalm 27, let's read this real quick. So going back to the verse, but I would have lost heart unless I had seen, believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's the hardest part for us because if you're like me, we, got in, we, got in a, uh, we were trying to go eat the other night at a, after a ball game and we were on time schedule. Here we go through town, there's a wreck. There's four lanes, mind you, they're hog, the wreck's hogging up the whole side that we're on. And I'm just like, let's go. Okay, forgive me. I know. There's a wreck up there. Someone may be hurt. And I'm like, let's go. I got to eat. Right? Yeah. You didn't think about that. You're like thinking, I would be thinking the same thing. Let's go. So we're sitting here. And we're just like, come on. I'm sticking my head out the window. What's going on up there? This guy's not policing correctly. Let's go let's get a police department knows where he's going so he could you know, stop traffic on this side so we can go around. Right? Just look at your neighbor and say, it's all about me. That's what it is. It's all about me. So I was trying to, and this is what was interesting, is we're like, let's just turn. We turn around. There's got to be another way around. We turn around. We go. We're driving 800 miles out of the way. We get, to the, we get back to the road that we're coming to, and here comes a bunch of cars. I'm thinking, I think we just were moving a lot. And if we would have just stayed right where we were, we'd be right in the same vein, right? But we couldn't wait. Why? Because it feels better to move than it does to let something happen. Why? Because moving feels like you're doing, right? So the more you're doing, the more it feels like God is doing. But let me just tell you, God has always done his thing already. He's just waiting for you to encounter the situation when the time's right. Call us your neighbor say the time has to be right. You don't want to arrive early or late. You want to arrive on time. And let me tell you something about him. He's always on time. You can alleviate a lot of stress in your life to know this about God. He is always on time with your situation and with mine. He never misses the schedule. Now, we may miss because I want to drive the long way around, right? Because I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait to see the goodness of God. I want to create the goodness of God. Right? I want to create the goodness, so I need to get something else, buy something else, do something else versus just simply sit and rest in the fact that God said, he's gonna do this. It's gonna make a big change in my life. 2024, I'm gonna do a bunch of things differently. I'm gonna do 30 different things. I got 24 steps I'm gonna be to a greater me. And the first step's like, eat differently. We're like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna change something else. I'm not gonna do that part. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this one out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not cuss on Thursdays. That's the, that's where we're, that's where we're, it, so, so why? Because it makes us feel like we're advancing somewhere versus just simply this. How about just let the Lord just work in us to be better than we were? Just better. Because when you start saying, think I'm going to be the best me, you're kind of putting a schedule out there that says, you know what? You're going to have to be perfect. And let me just give you some information. It's not going to happen, but that's okay because God is working in us to trust him. God is more interested in than connecting with you and growing than he is about you achieving a situation that makes church look better. That's not even, that's like bad to even say. He's not interested in how the church looks. He's wanting to see how you look on your inside. That's what he's all about. And that joy coming out. Okay, let me get, let me move. I'm just rattling there. Psalm 34, look at verse eight. Here we go. One more, one more thing about experience. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So you ever, you ever had someone come up to you and say, hey, this is really good. You need to try it. Oh, yeah, I was going to let you know it's got kale in it. I'm not eating it. <laughs> not trying it. I'm good. You just go ahead and enjoy that. I'm not doing it. So how many remember whenever we had our Thanksgiving meal and I dropped the bomb that I was going to bring pineapple casserole? You guys don't remember that? Or are you just not going not gonna to admit it? Okay, I'll talk about pride. And okay, so here. So I told you guys that, that, okay, this thing has pineapples in it and cheese. 
Oh, let me just say, let me just go and let me precursor this story. I don't like cooked pineapples at all. I hate them actually. I think it's disgusting. Hawaiian peach is like the worst creation on the planet, right? Amen. You guys probably like that. That's why I didn't say amen. And so I remember this being made for me the first time. I thought, I'm not eating that. Oh, you know, if you're a part of family that's like, you got to try everything 13 times before you know if you like it. And so, uh, so I remember getting a scoop of it like that much, mostly, uh, mostly the buttered crackers on top. And I remember taking a bite of it and thinking, wow, that's pretty good. Cheese and pineapples. Some of you, when I said that, were like, that's gross. How many of you knows can say today, when you ever, you, I told you I was bringing that, I was like, I'm not eating that. And then when you tried it, you're like, go ahead and give me that recipe. I know some of you. <laughs> like, so what was in that? I kind of like that. Why? Because if we have, if you have not tasted it, you don't know if it's any good. Right? So what he's trying to do is tell us here, in order to see goodness of God, you're going to have to try it. You're going to have to open yourself up to experience him. Now, that doesn't mean in a service you got to get out and dance down the aisle. Woohoo, let's come on, let me get free. That's not what that means. It means simply this, that when I'm in my life, I am attenting myself upon seeing him and his goodness in my life. Meaning this, Jesse nailed it. Anything that you see that is good, whether you got a good parking spot, that came from him. Well, that's kind of silly. You can think it's silly, or you can say that I'm experiencing the goodness of God. And you watch your faith grow because then you'll start to notice a ton of things in your life happening. And you're like, wow, God is always doing something. But before we never attribute it to him. And you will watch your experience with God increase that whenever he's talking about those songs, you'll be like, man, I can find myself singing these songs. Why? Because he is that good that I am actually enjoying this process. Isn't that amazing? Why? Why do you think couples go on dates just by themselves? Because they're trying to go and experience what they had before. Meaning this, we're going to remember who we were. We may be 45, but we're still like we're 20, right? And we're going to remember that. Why? Because you're only as old as you believe. And what God is trying to say to us about our experiences, is if you'll open up and to experience him, it'll transform your life. Revelation 3.20, here's an awesome verse. Behold, I stand at the door and I'm, I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Notice he says, I'm not, here I come. I'm gonna open your door. I'm gonna blow your door down. He says, I'm actually gonna simply come up and I'm gonna knock on your door. And he said, and it's up to you to open it, right? I remember when I moved to Northwest Arkansas, I, just, I didn't know anybody up there. I moved in this apartment and I lived in the center apartment. So two on the side of me. How many knows you're kind of in the middle so I'm the kind of, I'm, you know, I don't know anybody. So before I walked out the door, I would look out my peephole. <laughs> See if anybody's out there. Why? I don't talk to anybody. I don't know these people. And so I would look out the peephole first. And then when the coast was clear, I would go out to my car. And I, would, and I did this forever. And I started thinking, hey, uh, you're a pastor and you're trying to uh, start a church. I think, I think you have to get to know people in order for that to even happen. You know, it's, it's funny, but, but it's, it's, it's as subtle as things like that is, is I have to be the one that opens the door. He's knocking. He's the one knocking all the time. He knocks every day. But while I open that door, and I'm telling you, it's as simply as just opening your heart. And what I mean by opening your heart is just focusing your awareness on him. That, you know what, God? I'm going to look for your goodness. And I'm going to be aware of it that when I, when I experience something good in my life, I'm going to give you the glory for it. Because it is you. Every single good and perfect gift comes from him. Everything. So this week when you're going through your stuff, I want you to kind of uh, open up and let's determine that this year that we're going to experience him. We're not going to do church. We're not going to... I, I wrote on our, our, our Facebook this morning when I was talking about sharing the page of our new series is I wrote on here uh, uh, our Sunday experience. And I don't know why I wrote that, but I think it's something in my heart. You know, because we have church service, we do service. No, we're going to have a Sunday experience. Why? Because when we come to church, we're coming to experience God. We're coming to experience his goodness. We're coming to experience his love that flows through other people in the church. When you give them a hug, man, it's the goodness of God just flowing. And that's what creates 
a, a binding or knitting together in love. That's what creates that is an awareness of how much we need that and need each other. And as that happens, it will continue to grow. People will be like, I want to hug when I come to church. You'd be shocked how many people out there want somebody to hug them when they walk in. Why? Because no one ever hugs them. I about went to a total tangent, but I'm not going to go there. Why? Because it's an experience. When you experience something, it's interesting to just say, hey, Jesus loves you. He really does. He loves you more than you can imagine. But until you experience the fact that he does love you more than you can imagine, like he cared about your little situation that you thought nobody cared about, but he sent him to work it out, he cared that much about you. More than you can imagine. So this morning, what I want us to do is just, I'm praying for an awareness, an openness to experience him this year. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. So let me just say this as we're getting ready to pray. So what we may have to do, this may be the thing that, that is important, is to revisit or reimagine what the experience you had with him or that moment. Why? And you may think, well, that sounds weird. That doesn't sound like church. Well, think about this. In the Old Testament, he would always tell them, hey, I want you to make this altar to remind you that I led you across this sea. What he's telling them is, I want you to reimagine that whenever you come to a situation that says, you can't do this anymore. Hey, you remember when God led us through the sea? He literally dried it up and we walked across on dry land. It's pretty incredible. And he wants us to remember that. You may have to go back and experience God from your salvation again. Go back and think about how you felt that day. How much you were loved and you felt freedom. Because that's the same thing that is working in your heart today. That same freedom. But our mind wants to cloud it up and say that that's not God. You're not free. He doesn't love you. All those are lies, right? Because what Jesus did for us gave us abundant life. He made us righteous. He took away our lack on the inside. And now we're totally free in him. Amen? I want you to just close your eyes just for a moment. I want to pray. Father, I thank you for what it is that you're doing right now. I feel very prophetic about this, that this is a year of experiencing something in a new way, that you're transforming and changing this church into something that is incredible in this little community. That when we go into our places of employment or our relationships or any situation that we encounter, we are going to see the goodness of God moving through us whether it's in a kind word, it may be just a hug, it may be a smile, but if we're gonna see the goodness of God be revealed through this family in such a way that we are not gonna have room enough to contain it. I just speak over every dream this morning that those that are dreaming big for this year, I pray that you would uh, ignite that dream in such a way through their experience, that they will think upon the goodness of God and what you've done, especially in these last few months, and that they would just be overwhelmed with the goodness, that the grace of God would just be poured out upon them. That they would be so full of the love of God by experience that they wouldn't know about you, but they would know you. I thank you for that peace right now that passes all understanding. And I ask for you to do this today in Jesus' name. Why don't you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed really quick. I wanna, I wanna ask this question this morning. Maybe you're here. I don't know. I'm just going to ask this. Maybe you're here and, and, and Jesus has never maybe been the center of your life. He's been in your life. He's been around your life. Or maybe he, he was the center of your life and it's felt like that you've kind of drifted away and he wasn't the center and we became the center. Whatever the story is. Uh, if that's you this morning and you want to set him right back in the center, Maybe you don't know him as Lord and Savior. Well, I want to invite you to do that this morning. Maybe you've walked away or you've kind of let your heart drift away and, and, and you want to center it back in him. Remember, the, the key is just repentance. Repentance means to change the way you think. I'm no longer thinking I'm the sinner. I'm no longer thinking I'm the Lord of my life. Jesus is the Lord of my life. So if that's you this morning, really quick, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to simply ask this because it's between you and him right where you sit at this moment. If you're here this morning and that's you, just lift your hand and wave at me. I'm just saying this because I know to pray for you right now. Just really quick, slide it up and slide it right back down. Thank you. I see your hand. You can go put it right back down. 
Anybody else here this morning? Come on, that's amazing. That's amazing. I see you. Anybody else? Just really quick. Thank you for being courageous. I know that's not easy. I know it feels like the weight of the world is on that arm to lift it. I get it. So this morning, we're going to pray. And I want you, church, as I pray and as you pray, I want you to pray for these two hands that went up. Because come on, this is, this is, this is life-changing. Can I tell you why it's life-changing? Because they're experiencing right now the goodness of God. And this may be a moment of transformation for their life forever. So come on, let's pray really quick and let's pray. And I want you that lifted your hand, even if you didn't lift it, you can receive. It's just simply about receiving a gift. And I want you to just believe this. We're gonna, we're gonna believe that Jesus died. He was buried and that he rose after three days. And he rose and he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And because he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he was raised from the dead. He has now declared you righteous in Jesus' name. Okay, so that's what we're gonna believe and we're gonna pray that right now. And I want you that have lifted your hand or wants to receive that, just to accept that and believe that, that it's now for you, okay? Father, right now we just pray and we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the gift of righteousness. So this morning, Lord, we've had hands lifted, hearts that are lifted, and we ask that you would make real the decision that they are now accepting, that they are receiving this morning the gift of salvation. They have declared that they believe with their heart that you died, that you rose or was buried, and that you rose on the third day. And now you are seated at the, at the right hand of the Father and that they have been made right by the blood of Jesus, that all their sins have been dealt with. They are no longer against them. They have been born in Jesus and now they are standing in this room as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for that gift. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. All we can do is receive it. So we as a body today receive that. And we pray for our new family members that you would grant them to be strengthened with all might in the inner man. That they would know you not just by mere knowledge, but by personal experience. And we thank you for that this morning. And we believe it and we receive it and we rejoice in it today in Jesus' name. Come on, say amen. Amen. Come on, give God a big hand this morning. Isn't it good? Thank you, Jesus. Hey, this morning, I want you to thank you for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse. Jesse, come on up here this morning. He's gonna make a couple announcements. Hey, day one or week one of the new year. It's gonna be a great year. I'm gonna ask you to do all kinds of, we've got ladies things coming up. Um, uh, real quick while Jesse's getting ready, I wanna let you know, so our, our life groups are launching uh, back in February, the first Wednesday in February. I'm preparing some things that, um, if you haven't been a part of a life group, or maybe you just haven't been at church that much or in your life, uh, we're gonna walk through a thing that God put on my heart. It's, gonna, it's about the foundations of faith, and it's going to be something that is gonna be so stinking amazing for your foundation, because if your foundation's wrong, everything else gets confusing. Church gets confusing. What we teach gets confusing. Why? Because it sounds worky really quick, like works. And so we're going to go through this foundation. I'm walking through it with you at the same time. And it's something that God has put on my heart. And I'm telling you, it's awesome. It's going to have little work pages, but it, it's, it's only because it's keywords so that you'll remember those keywords. Okay, so don't get stressed out like, we got a test. No, it's not a test. It's just going to be something that you do throughout the week. You'll get them on Sunday. You do them for those first couple of days. And you can either listen to it online or you can, um, or you can uh, um, read it. It's like four or five pages. And it is phenomenal. I'm telling you, it's phenomenal. It is changing my life. And I've been studying this stuff for a while and it is just so good. Okay, so that's coming up in February, first Wednesday. Oh, you're sneaky. I am sneaky. <laughs> Love you guys. Known to be sneaky. You know, me and Josh both used Ephesians 3. And